We are ready to start. Um, again, welcome you to the session. And we start with an interesting talk by Sophie Hiltner, or she told me it's actually Zara Hiltner. And she will talk about the discovery of the sex in medicine. Please welcome Sarah. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very, very much for introducing me and to the curators of the session. Thank you for selecting my talk because I feel very passionate about it and I hope I can transfer some of this passion to all of you. I am blown away by how many people are here and interested in this. Um, since it's a tech conference, I thought I'd do something techy. Uh, and I know it is a, a venture capitalized tool, but if you want to participate in parts of this presentation, you can go to menti.com and insert the code 303063 and help me with doing a little bit science on stage. I don't know if it will work. I have only done this in English once. In German, it too usually comes out surprisingly well. But um, if you want to join, please do. Oh, I see some people are joining us. They're sending us hearts and kitty cats. That is awesome. I'm gonna, you can continue joining. Uh, I'm going to start with the story. And it is about an uh, accident. Father and son are driving in their car, and they're having an... Okay, wait, this doesn't work, so I'm going to show you this. So you can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, father and son are driving in their car, and they are having an accident. Both are being picked up by ambulances. The son got injured at his penis and is being delivered to a specialist unit in a different hospital than his father. Once the son has been brought into the operating room, the attending urological surgeon comes in and says, I cannot operate. This is my son. My question now for all of you is how are the son and the surgeon related? Type in the first thing that comes into your mind. I'm going to repeat the story really quickly. Father and son have an accident, both get injured, being delivered to different hospitals, and the urologist that has to take care of the injury of the son says I cannot operate because it's my son. I would love to show you the results, but it doesn't show on the big screen, which is a pity. But there are still people joining and answering questions. Um, and I'm going to give you a minute. <laughs> I don't know how to, I can only describe then what I can see on the, on the slides and can, can put it up later on um, insert is in the in the presentation so the biggest word that pops up in a word bubble that is on this tiny screen now is the word mother and thank you for thinking this way because yes that's the possibility when i do this experiment in german usually people think of oh, wait a minute it's the stepfather or a father of a homosexual relationship, or it's the adoptive father. So it's some kind of male person that is uh, related to the son, but they do not think about mother because German is a highly gendered language. When we say surgeon, we say chirurg, and we are used to apply it for male as for female surgeons, but there is a distinctive word that is chirurgin, which would be the female version. Which brings me to the point um, that what I've already mentioned, we live in a gendered world. To give you a broad overview of what you can expect in the next couple of minutes, is I going to determine what we're actually talking about? What is sex? What is gender? Because both are very, very important when it comes to medicine. The next thing will be how I am trying to hack the medical system by doing the research I'm doing, because that men and women and other bodies exist is a very, very new idea in medicine. The major terms I'm going to be discussing, uh, I, I will discuss, is sex. So the genitals and the genes and, and the hormones. It's the gender identity, 
which is also reproduced in society in different facets, it is how we express our gender, whom we are attracted to. And in the end, I'm going to give you an example of the heart attack that is the best researched version of sex and gender sensitive medicine. So let's talk about sex. When I say sex, I do mean the physical body. I am referring to genitals, I am referring to hormones, I am referring to genes, the hip shoulder ratio. But there are not only two sexes. There is the option that we now call intersex, which has been there for a very long time. It just has been neglected by medical research for most of the time. And that means when a baby comes out, the first thing people are looking for is between the legs and can we identify of what's there. If we can't identify it up until this year, they had seven days to decide if this baby is supposed to be male or female. And what one surgeon told me was, well, you know what, Sarah? It's easier to drill a hole than to build a pole. I think you should not cut into any healthy tissue, no matter how old or young a child is, but particularly if it's a baby and all the exits are functioning, just don't touch it, leave it. The baby won't mind. And you will probably save it a lot of trouble once puberty hits, the hormones kick in, and the body will actually develop into either or, or indecisive. It's an option. So when you're assigned a sex at birth, you carry it along. We are used to this tradition, and it actually comes from the old Greek, that they thought the male body is the ideal and the upper best expression of how a human being can be. And women just lack a lot of fire to turn their penis out. That's seriously what they believed, and it's called the one sex body, and it has been predominantly reproduced in medicine over the time, until enlightenment struck, and suddenly, whoa, we have two bodies now. Everything that um, has been looked at under a microscope, so they looked at testicles, they looked at ovaries, and thought, whoa, those are different tissues, maybe it's not a penis inside out, but maybe it is something entirely different, and right they were. Um, but they only thought about it in a bikini model way, which is a term that Marianne Legato uh, originated a couple of years ago, because it refers to the fact that everything that's covered by a bikini has been outsourced to gynecology. But the rest of the body, of course, is not in... <laughs> ah, there's no difference, nah. It's, it's sufficient, like, okay. So when sex and gender sensitive medicine approached, it came from a long history of women's health movement. So yes, the ideology of feminism and bra burning and angry feminists is all in there. It used to be at least, because now we discovered, wait a minute, men are actually discriminated as well. In a lot of diseases, we underestimate the risk for men. Depression, for example, osteoporosis, and many more that we don't even know about. Again, sex, physical body, genitalia, hormones, pheromones, all this influences your medical charter, so to speak. So it has differences in symptoms. You, as a man or as a woman, also when you identify as a non-binary person, your body is still genetically made up and it has hormones, and so it also will react differently to medication and pharmaceuticals. But also when a disease will come, the prevalence of the disease. For example, a heart attack in women is 10, 10 years later because they have estrogens that make the insides of their blood veins and vessels really smooth, so a clot cannot develop there, so there won't be a heart attack. At least not for another 10 years, because men lack this hormone. But there's also a bunch of similarities. Our job now is it, as a sex and gender sensitive researchers, to distinguish when does sex matter, when does gender matter. 
But in sex, we have a lot of differences and similarities. I've talked a lot about genes and hormones, and we actually now have a way to distinguish if the genes have an impact on health or if it's the hormones. So this four-core genotype mouse model is a mouthful, and I tried to explain it as simple as possible, but it is complicated. So you start out with a male and a female mouse. The male mouse has an X, Y minus SRI. The Y minus is a natural mutation that stops this mouse from developing testes. So it will not have male genitalia. The SRI, on the other hand, is then inserted in the mouse to make it develop genitalia, male genitalia, and gonads, the sexual um, reproductive organs, to then recreate or procreate <laughs> with the female mouse. In the offspring, next generation now, you have four different outcomes. The female versions have the X and... Okay, we have two female versions. One is an XY minus and one is an XX. The XX is a just regular female. It has a genetic makeup of a female mouse and it has the hormones. The XY minus mouse because it's lacking the minus, it will turn out to become a female mouse on the outside, but genetically, it is still a male mouse. In this way, we can determine and distinguish if the hormones or the genes, the genes have a different makeup. The other way around, with the male mice, there we have an XX mouse, which is a genetic setup of a female mouse, included the SRI gene, and that makes it now uh, turn f male. So that's one part that you can do in research. And a lot of parts in research are still done on mice and, and, and rats, so we use rodents. What we underestimated in the last years is that the pheromones from the axilla steroids, though, all the stuff that makes your axilla smelly, is having an impact on how we interact with each other and also how animals interact with us. For example, uh, in um, the 70s, Barbara McClintock found out that the menstrual cycle synchronization within women, that they have their period at the same time, is actually leads to those or leads back to those steroids but it also influences how you perceive pain and how you are willing to express pain. Interesting thing is, when someone now comes in with a certain steroid, axillary steroid, um, you will also react differently to your pain and express it differently. In 2014, there was an experiment that looked for sex differences in the researcher and the effects on the mice. And it turned out that the exposure of mice and rats to male but not female experimenters produces pain inhibition. This means male research goes into a lab, tries to induce pain in rats, and they will show it at a certain amount of time. When a female researcher reproduces these experiments, the rats and the mice, they admit earlier that they are in pain. When we can now add one more layer, and this would be when a male researcher takes off um, his lab coat, gives it to the female researcher, and she now doing the same experiment, she will get the same result as the men before. So the male body does not have to be present in the lab to influence these results. It's sufficient if the pheromones are in the air. This effect only lasts about 30 minutes, but I don't know many researchers that have the time to just sit in their lab rat to calm down the rodents to then experiment on them. But it is not standard to actually say in published papers with rodent um, experiments which sex the researcher had. But it's proven that it does have an impact, and we should be more aware of that. When I talk about diseases and differences, I want to give you one example of osteoporosis, which is the loss of density in the bones, which means the bones get brittle and they start breaking more easily. 
Osteoporosis was long believed to be a solely female disease. But not quite. We just found out that actually it's underestimated in men, and once they turn 70, they increase the risk of having osteoporosis as well. What the unfortunate thing is, if they have a fracture in comparison to women, they are more likely to die because of this fracture. So they're endangered in this, this case. And when I looked for pi images and pictures of osteoporosis, the only thing I could find were ones where women is represented. But I will come back later to that. Let's talk about gender identity. Gender identity is how you feel in your head, how you identify, and how you experience your gender, also based on how much you align with what your body is. So when I, as a gender person, am here, I can tell you I identify as a woman. And when we before talked about sex, Sometimes it is interesting to wonder what someone else has in their pants. Yes, but it's just to say briefly, it's very impolite to ask. Sorry to say, like, just don't. If you wonder, maybe they'll tell you if they're ready. But if you don't intend to have sex with them on a consensual basis, don't ask. Made that mistake. So. <laughs> with a gender identity, you also don't know. People will or will not tell you if they identify with a more womenness or with a more maleness. Um, but they can also identify as non-binary, which means they do not identify with either or. And sometimes they're even uncomfortable with what body they have. If someone tells you, just respect that. It's awesome that they trust you so much that they do tell you. So also there. Um, but the gender identity is highly influenced by society as well because there are also expectations from society to how we are supposed to behave, to how women have to be kind of soft-spoken and timid and pretty. And I know I'm here in a group of very privileged people, and I think it's awesome that we're building this utopia here, and we're living a different kind of society that I so hope will be mainstreamed. But it's not in the mainstream yet. And this is... Stories to learn to read for boys and girls. I let yourself choose which one's which, and you're not an English speaker, but I think it's quite clear. The only thing I do want to point out... Um, <laughs> and just to mention that all the head chefs and bakers and all the famous ones are usually men, so I think they made a mistake right there. When we talk about expression, well, look at me. I have to carry the microphone sender at the back of my dress because, well, fashion designed for women lacks pockets. Yes, so please continue hacking that. <laughs> <laughs> so the gender expression has a lot to do with grooming. How do I style? How do I carry myself? How do I speak? How affectionate and how... Um, do I choose my mannerisms? And also there you can be you and the unicorn you are to all the way women and to all the way male. Everything should be okay, and we should not punish anyone for not complying to that. Now, how does gender influence our medical records? Well, for example, the assumption of the susceptibility of diseases. Susceptibility of diseases. When you're a young man, and you suddenly have erectile dysfunctions, you probably would not have estimated that that is something that hit you. When we then add a little bit of depression to the equation, it is also something that men and depression, it's starting to become a subject. It's starting to become a subject. But so far, men talk differently about their symptoms, they experience their body differently, and they also, just as women don't think they can have a heart attack, you have attached to your gender certain, certain expectations of what you want, no, what you think you can have or develop as a disease. Another thing is the interaction with the doctor. So, like I mentioned before, how men and women act with other people, how we describe stuff, is 
very different, can be very different. On top of that comes when you're a woman and you want birth control, you have to go to a gynecologist at one point of your life, and once you're in the system, you have to come back every year. When you're a man, well, when you're a child, male child, you go to the doctor because your mom makes you, and then... Oh, wait, there was a flu. Really sick, but managed to get over it. And then maybe with 35, 40, you have to do the prostata thing. Well, till then, you didn't have the time women had to practice the interaction with doctors. So that's also another point. When we now switch the way around, your doctor also looks at you and expects a certain kind of gender and a certain kind of behavior. And when you have now a urologist and the Mr. Floppy situation going on, which might be related to actually being pressured at work, having the pressure of being the single breadwinner in a family, or simply because you're sad and life sucks sometimes, and you just don't know how to talk about it. Well, I don't think a urologist is the first person that will point that out. Some do, some are excellent. I don't want to do doctor bashing here. But it's all related to how we move about and what society is actually expecting of us. And that brings me to norms and stereotypes. When we say all men are like this and all women are like this, that's more of a stereotype. But a norm is something that is being punished by society when you divert from it. So when you suddenly, you're a man and you burst out in tears in the middle of public, people will react in a certain way. And I tell you, most times it's unpleasant. Even as a woman bursting out in tears, ugly crying all the way, public can lead to some distraction. But when you're a man, oof, that's a tough one. Um, and that is something we underestimate as an effect as well, because everybody is judging. That's how we box our worlds. And we try not to, I try not to, but it's hard. And I talked to about depression before, and it is more common as a form of anxiety in women, and more men are using substances to deal with the depression. Unfortunately, men are really successful killing themselves when they're depressed. So I was very, very happy that Lindworm yesterday made us all stand up to show if you have experience with depression and you're willing to talk to someone it doesn't feel like all glory, sunshine out of your ass, rainbows, awesome, thank you, because it is a sensitive, it is a serious problem. And we need to talk about how do we evaluate depression, actually. All the scales and measures we have are kind of related to being sad and being open of admitting of being sad, having sleeping troubles. But if you, don't know you're not, if you don't know your body that well and don't know how to talk about it, how, don't know how to address it in front of a doctor, then maybe they just miss the cues. They may be just not used to see a male version of depression because it can be the responsibilities. It can be that you have to work, your child is at home, and you hate leaving every morning. You would love to be a stay-at-home dad, but you risk losing your job when you tell your boss, hey, I want to stay at home. And that's something that's also related to the gender norms. And once you've taken the little blue pills, going back to erectile dysfunctions, you've taken care of the symptom, but not of the cause, which is also something we need to talk about in medicine, that a lot of those pills take care of the symptoms, but not of the actual cause of diseases. <laughs> Thank you. I think I made it quite clear that sex and gender are a bit different. And now we're going to go to an example of the heart attack. I want to briefly address that the attraction to someone uh, can also impact your health. Because, um, for example, when you're a lesbian woman and you never had to go to a gynecologist to get oral contraception, well, you're kind of not in the system and the incidences of cervical cancer are higher in that group because they're not being screened, because they have no reason to go to a gynecologist. On the other hand, when you're a homosexual man, you're banned for life. You used to be banned for life donating blood. Now you can donate blood, but you have to practice abstinence for one year. Yes. 
Okay, I need a sip of water. I'm going to start with the second part of the presentation soon. But before that, since I'm also a physical therapist, we're going to do a little breathing exercise. So please stand up. No, 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 don't stand up. So sit down. But <laughs> come lean a bit forward, move on your chair a bit to the front. Yes, sit up straight and take a deep breath in. Hold it in for a second and out. One more time, deep breath in. Hold it. And all the men, breathe out. Yes. For the women, hold on. Before the women, um, the non-binary people can continue breathing because you're not mentioned in any of the medical textbooks anyway so far, so just, sorry. I tried, but uh, the women are still holding, yes, okay. Uh, okay, 15 seconds, fair enough. Continue breathing. The thing is, if you, as a woman, would have had a heart attack, it would take about 15 minutes longer to reach the operating room than a man. But be at ease, it used to be 90 minutes. It's progress. In the heart attack, which is one of the best researched uh, examples we have by now, and probably a lot of you have already heard of it, but I'm not tired of reusing it because the data is 30 years old, and I looked in medical textbooks from the newest generation, and I have not found a lot of that data there. But when we talk about heart attack differences in the sexes, we need to talk about symptoms. What I learned as a physical therapist was that when someone in front of me has chest pain, pain in the left side of the body, and cold sweat, heart attack, emergency, call 112 in Germany and deliver them to the hospital as soon as possible. When I started working in the Institute of Gender Sensitive Medicine, I was introduced to new facts. Well, most women show weakness, shortness of breath, back pain and nausea. So we put them on the couch, we send them to an orthopedic and, I don't know, uh, make them rest of it? That's one of the reasons why women get delivered late to the hospital. Another one is the awareness in themselves. So when you ask women, what are you most afraid of dying, they say cancer. When you ask men, a lot of them will say heart attack. When we look at the data, at the data from 2015 in Germany, then actually cancer on the, what is it for you, the left side, is less deadly, all major cancers are less deadly than cardiovascular diseases. And when you look at the cardiovascular diseases, it actually shows that women, the light blue, are more in risk than dying, in dying from a cardiovascular disease than men. When we now look at breast cancer and the heart attack, it shows that, yes, less men die of breast cancer. That is true, but there are men that die of breast cancer. But it's also that less women die of a heart attack, uh, less women die of cancer in comparison to heart attacks. And when we now compare like, how many people have died of a heart attack, then it is 43% were female. I know, it's not 50, but it's just the awareness of how I think, I, how I, think I, I am susceptible to a certain disease. We need to campaign for cardiovascular diseases in women. We need to campaign for raising awareness that the heart attack is a serious threat for women as well. Because in breast cancer it has worked. Women are now sensitized to that, so we can move on to the next one. The acknowledgement by uh, other people, the breathing exercise. When I looked at the medical textbooks I'm going to refer to later, I'm going to refer about later, you will see that there is a bias in medicine, and this bias leads to delay delivering to the hospital. It leads to more severe side effects in um, administering pharmaceuticals. And one of the examples for is, is aspirin or ASS. When someone has a heart attack, one of the standard medications is to give them ASS or aspirin. And um, that will protect the men for another heart attack, for a reinfarction. But in women, it will all only protect them to 
have a uh, stroke. And we don't know quite why this is, but this is what the data showed. So medications can have different effects in different sexes. If we know all this, and I said the heart attack is something we've researched for 30 plus years now, why do we actually need to talk about it? Why am I here? Because there's a bias in medical textbooks that I've looked into. And one is androcentrism, which means the medicine is centered around a male body. So I looked at a lot of textbooks, I read a lot of chapters, and I brought you some pictures. I don't know if you can see a pattern. This is a selection. They are not all. When I showed all, I was critiqued in practicing this talk. It's just too long. People will get the point, trust me. So all those pictures and medical textbooks, only in the chapters about a heart attack, that 43%, I know, representation of women in pictures. We're not talking about, like, photographs. It's painted pictures, not one woman. Gender insensitivity is something when you research in, on one sex and then transfer it on the other without checking if it's actually applicable. So in this book it said in German, special patient groups. Underneath it's the subgroups are older patients, women, patients with renal insufficiency, diabetes and anemia. Congratulations, women. We all belong into the category of chronic diseases. Oh, but um, although we're so special, in the bottom line it says, well, generally, you should still take the same approach as with men. Wait, so we're really special and we're atypical, but we are being treated the same. Great. Brings me to the last bias. It's the double standard. Same situation for the same for different sexes, but they are treated differently. In this case, I translated a quote from a book which says, in case of a heart attack, immobilize the patient and remove restricting clothes, tight shirt color, neck tie. Well, I think you know what I mean. It's, um, and then in, in, in German, you have usually in books this, this one quote, like, because it's easier to read, we're only going to use the male version of this word, of like patient, and women are Im Im implicitly meant as well. Well, but we ignore them explicitly. One book was really honest. They say, well, RSS is good for preventing. Uh, it's just for women, we have insufficient data for a general recommendation. So, congratulations, dear medical students, trying to figure out with them. I've talked a lot about now uh, about in, um, the differences between the sexes, but there are also a lot of similarities. And this is the big differentiation we need to make, because the intersex differences and the intrasex differences need to be regarded. I made an image here, just one side is supposed to be the male population, the other one the female population. The two dashes at the top, they are uh, representing one, how big the difference is between the sexes in the, um, in the general comparison are. When you look at the broader picture of the actual intra-sex differences, so in the group of women, what are the differences there, and in the group of men, what are the differences there? They are a lot bigger. The problem is we don't even look for the sexes separately. So the first step is to look and separate research into men and women. And again, I'm very, very sorry not to include binary, non-binary persons to be in the binary because medicine is discovering this binary as we speak. So it will be a very slow process to go to gender as a spectrum, to sex as a spectrum. But we need to start somewhere and we need to start looking for those two groups to then actually dissect these groups in comparison to each other. Why is it not mainstream yet? I have interviewed a lot of um, gender medicine experts and I brought a quote from a Nobel Prize winner. And Mr. Tim Hunt said, 2015, three years ago, let me tell you about my trouble with girls. Three things happen when they are in the lab. You fall in love with them, 
they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. Three years ago, but there's no, no bias in, in medicine, in science. Um, some experiences of the resistance of the pioneers of gender medicine. One said, well, they just did not see the problem. They thought I was the problem. Shooting the messenger works everywhere, I guess. Another one was, well, if you're a cardiologist for 25 years, you have to learn now that you may have done things wrong with many female patients. It's not nice to accept. And I agree. When you're a medical doctor and you have been practicing for a long time with knowledge you thought is accurate, it's part of your identity and it's hard to digest. It's a bitter pill to swallow to suddenly realize maybe you have overdosed, maybe you have even killed someone. So I know that this kind of resistance is, is there and we need to address it. Nevertheless, we need to change the system. We don't come around it. One last thing is there's also resistance because sometimes gender will be associated with an ideology of feminism. And I say, well, of course, I'm a feminist. I really am a feminist, but what I am doing now is based on the theory and not ideology of feminism. But I will implement it into just practical proposals for education and daily practice. So we, as gender-sensitive researchers, are met with a lot of hostility within our own research environment. Um, and gender is being very like, ugh, like maybe over there, maybe the social sciences can take care of. Well, we try. I'm a sociologist working in a medical faculty, trying to improve it, but it's difficult because there are two different um, cultures. We're coming now to a new problem that I've just encountered doing my current research, algorithms. When we are now entering the new decade of computer-assisted diagnostics, when we, knew, when we want to help doctors making the right decisions, we need to feed them data. All the book examples I showed you were books published in 28 to 2012. So they were the most recent editions of those books, and they were available in one-third of all medical libraries in Germany, at least in one-third. One of the books was actually in every library. And if now this kind of knowledge is being fed to algorithms that then have to computer assist, we don't get rid of the bias. And I know there's a lot of research about it out there, but I would also like to um, invite you on the one hand to a conference that is happening at the Radboud University in Nijmegen on bias in artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Um, the call for papers is still open. If you have something, if you know something, please contribute. It will be very interesting. And I would also like to give you the uh, opportunity to go back to Menti and help with any ideas you have. I will read through those if I can manage to switch the slide. Yes, there we go. <laughs> okay. I, I, I would love to show you. I can't. Um, I don't know why it's not working, but it, the first one was get rid of AI. I like that. Well, I hope I could enlighten you a little bit. I thank you very much for listening and participating in my presentation. And uh, please reach out on uh, Twitter uh, or contact me via email if you have any questions or ideas that we cannot um, address in the Q&A that's now following. Um, but yeah, Q&A starts now, I guess. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Sarah, for a wonderful talk. And the paper, the talk is open for discussion and open for questions. Are there any questions? I see no urgent ones, so I will start with one. Or is somebody running to microphone two? Okay, it's your question, yeah. I have to. I have Microphone just, two. Hello. I have just a very brief question. 
Um, those quotes from women who are identified with names of colors, I was wondering, did you gather those as part of your research? Were they anonymized? Can you tell me the story behind that study? Yeah, uh, it was my master thesis, and I interviewed uh, 20 experts of uh, sex and gender sensitive medicine in Europe. And um, I asked them about how and if they have managed to implement it at their respective universities. And that's why I, uh, I interviewed them all myself and transcribed it and then um, analyzed it, why we have so much resistance and why it's not moving on because it is such a broad subject that it's actually going across all the specialties in medicine. But now it's established as like a site specialty, which is conflicting as well. But it's, the, it's work in progress. I mean, the discipline of sex and gender sensitive medicine is like 20 years old. So we're talking about cutting edge new medical I know 20 years is a long time for you <laughs> and your experience as a work field, but in medicine, everything turns a lot slower. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Oh, we continue with the microphone too, yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. So as a woman, this was the first time that I heard that there's a difference between, you know, heart attacks for men and women in terms of symptoms. Um, and I'm not asking you to list all the different symptoms in other things, but are there any other major things that we should be aware of that, where there are known differences? Well, metabolization of um, medication is a big, big um, in, in influence. And um, usually women need less medicine, um, but more often. So the amount, but it's something you need to discuss with your doctor. And I was quite surprised that most of the medications that are handed out are not weight adapted at least, because usually women are also a little bit lighter in weight. Um, but I'm so sorry to say, I'm also not a medical doctor, I'm a sociologist. So I'm trying to um, cover it, but ask your, ask your doctor about it, make them do the research because they are the experts and they should come back to you with an answer. We continue with the microphone, too. Um, you also talked about um, intersex people. Yes. Did you come across any research um, where, it's, yeah, where, where diseases in intersex people are dealt with, or like how the male and female uh, thingy is coming, you know, is kind of connected to that? I personally have not. And I think the research in that area is very, very marginal. It's because there are still a lot of doctors that are experts in that area and that do misgendering, that address the people with the wrong pronouns. And it's, uh, I think they, I'm very sorry to say, but trans and intersex people have the longest way to go and ahead of them. But it's, it's just, I, yeah. We need to do it ourselves, otherwise nobody will actually take care of it, I guess. Sorry to say. Okay, I see a question at microphone four. Or are you guys just standing there? <laughs> no question? <laughs> no, I have a question. Okay, Hi. thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm a doctor, so I'm very interested in your opinion um, towards uh, the development considering why we are all here, so considering the digital transformation of health, and do you have the impression from a sociologist perspective that it's getting better, or is it just young white men now replace the old white men, and um, all the apps out there are very, very gender insensitive and stuff? Thanks. Uh, the second part, yes, all the apps out there are still very, very gender insensitive because the knowledge that needs to be inserted is still being researched. Um, I fear the old white men are not replaced by old, old, by young white men, but also by young white women that act like white old men. Um, <laughs> we're talking about medicine. It's as a sociologist, it's one of the most hierarchical and most traditional uh, cultures within our system. So there it is moving really slowly and those power relations are replaced very, very slowly. So I don't think I'm going to benefit from my research, to be honest. So sorry. But that's also a burden I have to live with. But I still do my job for you and your children. So. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, microphone one, please. Hello, thank you Hi. for your talk. Um, can we lift our hopes in seeing that um, most, well, not most, but about 60% of medical students uh, nowadays are female? It does bring forth change, um, but slowly. But I do have to say I have a lot of hope for the younger generation in general. Like with each younger generation, we do have people that are energized, that are more open, that have lived with series is like, I don't know, sense with representations of people of color, with trans people, with intersex people, that have been more in touch with it, so it feels more natural to them, so there's less resistance, which is a good thing. Um, and that will bring change as well, because you can't underestimate the influence of pop culture, so... Um, I, I wouldn't say it's the hope that more women are coming in the research, um, but it's that the general, we as a society get more open and more aware. Microphone two, please. Hi, um, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, my question is if uh, we could see AI as a chance rather than a threat, um, because I'm, I'm also working in a field related to medical IT, and I think most efforts go into analyzing a lot of data from patients with the attributes, where sex is one attribute, and not in learning textbook knowledge, which just repeats the bias? I, I totally agree. I think actually AI and the new uh, way of, of analyzing data and, and compiling data is very, very interesting and important to, to feed that, but we still have to consider and be aware that there might be a gender bias in the assumption. And that's my, my research is on um, finding out how we can operationalize gender and make that one of the variables in the equation um, to see if that has an influence as well. Okay, number four, please. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. We, you had some very good examples in there. There's just one example where I'm not sure it's the menstrual synchrony thing. I'm pretty sure this is not state of the art anymore to say there's menstrual synchrony in women. Sorry, I didn't understand that. The menstrual synchrony thing, yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure that science doesn't say that anymore. Okay. Well, um, then I'm going to do my research on that. Thank you for the, rec um, for the, for the input. Okay. Number two. Hi, um, I was wondering if in some questions it could be useful to skip the gender question and just go to genes right away because uh, medicine is getting very complex with genes which are factors going into the equation so maybe this could be easier for many questions. Do sociologists think about that? I can't say I have. But maybe if you have time that sounds very interesting to, to talk more or elaborate more on that. Yes, just uh, like neuroscience, you have, um, you know, you have the genes uh, in the brain, and depending on which gene you have, you are more susceptible to, uh, like, uh, nicotine addiction, smoking, which is a factor which leads to heart attack and stuff as well. So uh, this is as well as the sex. Um, you have this influence, but you have the genes as well. So this is very interesting too, and uh, maybe at some point sex is just one factor which goes into that, but it's not uh, the only one. No, no, of course it's not the only one, but we have to start looking for it, because so far it hasn't. It's not systematically integrated in research. Like, when some, sometimes the... Um, um, uh, sometimes they, they do have a group of male and female mice, rats, humans, um, and then they kind of divide those groups, but sometimes they even miss that step. So it's not systematically integrated yet as a variable in the, the research. And I think I, I, I want to advocate to do that. Like it is, yes, that, like we need to start with that, actually acknowledging that we have to look for sex differences. And if there are none, awesome. Then we can move to look for other differences, but we need to know. Yeah. Microphone four, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I really liked the part where you showed that the research itself is gender influenced with the mice and the lab code. Um, thinking to the issue about data for intersex people, um, is there 
Is there uh, some research in uh, how often we actually do have data for intersex people in the samples we do for the research? Or are there ev is there enough data for intersex people to be represented? Or do we need other ways of researching this issue? I think most um, trials will ask for uh, male or female. And if you're intersex, you can participate. It would be an exclusion criteria because the sample group would be too small, so you'd have to kick them out anyway for statistical reasons. Sorry. Um, I guess there is one more question at number two. Uh, so as far as I uh, understand, there is a huge gap in time when it comes to uh, uh, pain. So women most likely will uh, wait longer for treatment when it comes to pain. Uh, so my question is, do you have uh, any ideas how we could address that? Well, that's a complex issue, and the research I've read about is that um, women are trained to do their care and put their care work first. So I just have to finish the dishes, or wait, I need to pick up the kids, or I know those are also kind of stereotypes I'm, I'm now referring to, and they're old-fashioned, but they're still present and they're still harming people, because when you're trained to do this all your life, you are less likely to actually take care of yourself and take yourself seriously. Number four, please. Um, I had a question about the uh, heart attack rates in women. Mm -hmm. So with this 43%, do women actually have less often heart attacks? Or can it still be the case that the cause of death, death is not recognized as a heart attack? That's an excellent question. Well, it's hard to, to, to know, um, but we need to, to look more for that. And it's also that men can have this female version of a heart attack, which can then be misdiagnosed and uh, not, not be, um, the life cannot be saved because people just don't react on, on those triggers, on those symptoms. Um, but we need, to, we need to look into it of why people have died, of course, but an autopsy you wouldn't do when someone is old and it looks like something. So I guess there are a couple of missed, yes. Thanks. Number two, please. Hi, thank you. I was wondering if you've come across any examples of perhaps people doing quantified self stuff, uh, contributing to um, these issues or perhaps providing data or research uh, that traditional medicine hasn't been doing. I'm sorry to say I have not, no. <laughs> But also good to look into, yeah. yeah. Maybe someone in the, in the audience would be interested. Yes. In. Please reach out, let me know <laughs> if you do. Okay, I think there are no more questions. So, thank, thanks to you for the for the discussion and the questions. But most of all, of course, <laughs> thanks Sarah for the wonderful talk. <laughs>